The loss of a loved one can leave you feeling depressed, angry, alone, lost. But you don't have to face this journey on your own. Open to Hope is a free community for anyone who has experienced loss. Find support. Find help. Find hope. Give grief a voice at Open to Hope. For more information, find us at opentohope.com. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we've got a great guest today, and I know that you are going to enjoy our guest. We know that you've had a lot of grief and loss in your life, and we know that you may have friends who have had. So we're here to support you on that journey and to walk with you where you are, and we've got a wonderful person to help us do that today. Our guest is John Welchholm, and the topic is finding your way back to joy after loss. So Heidi, do you want to tell us a little something about John? Absolutely, and, and John Welshon's been in the grief and loss world for a very long time. He's an expert. I'm so glad to have him here finally on our show today. Um, John is a counselor, teacher, and a lecturer. As a young child, John contracted polio and faced death, but had a miraculous recovery. At the age of 18, he again faced tragedy when his mother died of cancer. John is the author of the book, Awakening from Grief, and One Soul, One Love, One Heart. Today, we are also gonna pay tribute to author and teacher, Dr. Wayne Dyer, who recently died. Dr. Dyer was a friend of John's and wrote the foreword to his book, Awakening from Grief. Welcome to our show, John. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Gloria. Hey, John, great it is so you. great to have you on. And we've had you on our radio show before, mm -hmm. but this is the first time we've had a chance to meet you. Face to face, it's a beautiful Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Well, we think your books are so great, and I want to make sure before we get going on the show that people know about them. This one is called One When Prayers Aren't Answered. And then we have a second book, which is Awakening from Grief. And this is interesting because this is the one Wayne Dyer wrote the foreword mm -hmm. for, and we're going to be doing a little tribute to him mm -hmm. uh, as we get on with the show. And the next one is, I think this is your latest one, right? It is. Yes. Yeah, and it is one soul, yeah. one love, one heart. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you're working on another one too. You're quite the prolific <laughs> writer. Yeah. And I have a, three underway right now. Oh wow, my goodness. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, talk to us a little bit about your background. You know, I was really interested in hearing about you that one of the things that had happened to you is that you'd had a polio as a young child. Mm -hmm. And I think you probably know, and I was talking to Heidi about it, uh, sometimes when you look at the backgrounds of people that are very insightful or very involved in things like Milton Erickson, they have had something happen in their life early mm -hmm. that caused them to be somewhat isolated, somewhat thoughtful, and it can be at a very early age. I w wonder if that resonated with you. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, I think the, the main thing that I took away from that experience was that throughout my life there's been an awareness that we die. Mm -hmm. and even the awareness that children can die mm -hmm. and just a sense of great gratitude that I didn't. And now you had a, a kind of a miraculous recovery, right? Yeah. You, you were one of the last polio uh, people who got polio? Yeah, the Salk vaccine was certified for use while I was in the hospital. Wow, wow. And, and you were what, three or three something? Three years old. Isn't that amazing that that happened amazing. at that time? Yeah. And the doctors had told my parents that they should prepare themselves because there was a 99% chance I would die. Oh my gosh. And if I lived, they said a 95% chance that I'd be in an iron lung for the rest of my life. Now, were you in an iron lung at that time? No, not in the hospital. No. Uh huh. And uh, they called. How did you find out? How did they find out that you were okay? Well, my my father was praying with our minister and he had asked all of his friends and family and uh, relatives and business associates to pray in whatever tradition they practice. Uh -huh. and, and you he, had, you were parents knew Norman Vincent Peale, Oh, right? they were married by Norman Vincent yeah. Peale. Yeah. So you really had a big gun out yeah. there praying for you. Yeah, yeah, I was very blessed. And um, my dad had a vision 
of Jesus standing next to my bed in the hospital oh. with his hand on my forehead, smiling. Oh my goodness. And um, he sort of woke up and ran in and woke my mother up and said, don't worry, I think John's going to be fine. Oh, oh John. Minutes. There was a call from the hospital right after that. It was like 2.30 in the morning. And the nurse who called said, Mr. Welshans, there has been a miracle. Wow. Your son's fever has broken. He's up. He's alert. He's, you know, there's no sign of any significant paralysis, and he's demanding pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely a good sign. Yeah. Uh, That's amazing. Yeah. And the power of prayer is incredible. It is. And they've, they've since done a lot of research on the power of prayer. Mm -hmm. So... But you know, it's interesting in connection with what we're here to discuss today, mm -hmm. because the book, When Prayers Aren't Answered, mm -hmm. is um, addressing those times when I know and you know that mm -hmm. there are so many parents who have prayed for their sick children mm -hmm. yeah. and right. they die. Mm -hmm. And wanting to be the one that's in the hospital when the cure is found. Exactly. Because exactly. there will be, you know, with yeah. things left. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So what is your thought when they're not answered? If I'm watching this show and I have a, a child mm -hmm. or someone who's ill, or I want, they've already died and I wonder why, and I because I prayed so hard. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, it's a difficult one because here I've written an entire book to try to answer the question why, a question to which there is no answer, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the question that it almost drives people crazy to mm -hmm. think about that and wonder why did this happen to our child? Why did this happen in the way it happened? Mm -hmm. If God is all loving, how can it be? Mm -hmm. Right. And so the honest answer is I don't know. You know, I don't know. All I do know is that ultimately what's always available to human beings is love. Mm -hmm. And that nothing can take the ability to give and receive love away, mm -hmm. ultimately. Mm -hmm. People have a great loss, their hearts close, and they shut down temporarily. But uh, generally what heals is love, finding mm -hmm. a way to bring love into their lives again, to receive love and give love. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe the giving as time goes on is the beginning. I, I don't know, I've just found when we work with people that when there's, at first I think you have to give to yourself and yeah. let other people give to you. Yeah. I don't think people sometimes realize what a gift it is for other people to be able to help you when you've had a loss. So opening your heart to letting other people do anything, you know, small yeah. favors for you, maybe mow your lawn or take your kids to the store. Well, or, it's you a know. big step. Absolutely, and I always say being of service is also allowing other people to serve you. Mm -hmm. And then and then being able to do that. So I think maybe that's where the love comes back and forth. And then you had your mother died mm -hmm. uh, of cancer when mm -hmm. you were uh, in a senior 18. in high school, I would assume, yeah. 18, a mm -hmm. senior in high school. I think that's kind of key that you were a senior in high school too. When I was thinking about it, 18, and then you said something in your book about high school, and I thought, that's a tough thing to be a senior in high school and have a mother dying of cancer. It was, but it also was, you know, there's a bigger story to that with a, a different dimension of grief, which was that my parents were both really serious alcoholics before mm -hmm. I was born. Mm -hmm. And they got sober about six months after I was born. And then when I was 11 and a half, they started drinking again. Oh, wow. So we had 11 years of yeah. just a happy, happy household, I thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they introduced alcoholism into the mix again mm -hmm. and our home turned into a hell realm. Wow. So that was pretty much through my teenage years. And they started drinking together? Well, not necessarily. My dad was okay. doing a lot of traveling. He was okay. had a job. But that, they were both alcoholics, it sounds like, at yeah. the same time again. Right. Wow, that's tough for a kid. Yeah. So I think that's a form of grief that mm -hmm. is really significant because mm -hmm. it's uh, what our friend Ken Druck likes to call a living loss. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. It's where you're, you're having a loss on a daily basis. You're mm -hmm. losing the parent you love. You never know right. who you're going to be dealing with. Right. So there was a certain sense, actually, when my mother died of, you know, it may sound strange, but it was almost like a relief for her. Mm -hmm. It was her way out of a very difficult situation. She wasn't happy, and nobody right. was happy. And so... And we had some extraordinary moments as she was dying. 
And she died at home. At I know home. you yeah. said that, which was unusual for Very the time unusual. because people weren't doing hospice, and the doctor said that that's going to be messy, as exactly. I remember. Yeah. And uh, so you, you decided to have her. One thing you did have, which uh, I was saying to my husband, that not even the hospice people are doing now, is you had 24-7 nursing mm -hmm. right. care. Yeah. So I just want to say to people who are listening to this, hospice is great. It, it can be tough, too. And mm -hmm. particularly, you had a situation where you did have nursing care around the clock, and it, and it worked out well. Yeah, yeah. That was a big relief to the family. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, it was, you know, my mother just insisted that she wanted to be at home, and as you said, it was not done. This was yeah. 1969. There were no hospices then. Right. No one had even heard the term hospice. Yeah. So, um, and she had a brain tumor, and yeah. it affected her ability to speak. She became aphasic and mm -hmm. eventually just stopped speaking altogether. And... I had this moment when I realized that I was avoiding going in to be with her because it, I had been told that this would be more than I could deal with. Mm -hmm. And I finally thought, you know, for heaven's sakes, my mother is dying maybe within a couple of weeks. If I don't visit with her, I'll never have the chance. Mm -hmm. So I went in and sat on the edge of her bed, and we just started gazing in each other's eyes, mm -hmm. and we held hands. and. We had the most amazing connection mm -hmm. just by looking in each other's eyes. And, wow. you know, we wouldn't break our gaze for 30, 40 minutes at yeah. a time. Uh, That's incredible. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's really interesting for people to say this is more than you can bear. That, you know, it, people try to stop you from seeing bodies. They try to stop you from going to feel all sorts of things because they can't bear it. Right. I, I've had a lot of people uh, who didn't see their loved one's body mm -hmm. and, and have uh, felt badly about it later. And, and I have to say, if, if you are one of those people and you're watching this show, I always say to people this, look, you did the best you could at the time, mm -hmm. you know, and you just ha have to accept that. Sometimes I've he uh, heard people angry because family members stopped them from seeing their loved one. Mm -hmm. And I think forgiveness is a big thing, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, and also with kids. There's yeah. a lot of people that would say, okay, you're a teenager. Uh -huh. Your mom is dying. You shouldn't go in there and be with her. Right. You're too young. You can't handle it, and it wouldn't be good for you. When your reality was that it was, it was very good for you and very healing, it sounds yeah. like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was just an instinct, you know. Mm -hmm. It was that I didn't want to later regret you know, the fact that I hadn't interacted with my mother. Right. And I wanted to find a way to do it, even though she couldn't speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she could communicate, you know. And it was, you know, there was this moment, I'll never forget, when I was looking in her eyes and we were holding hands. And I su suddenly had this sense that everything was okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that our relationship was basically complete. And she was only 55 at the yeah. time. Yes. You know, I, I, I like what you're saying, that moment when you know that everything's okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're trying to find. Yeah. We're trying to find after that loss, when can you find and how can you find that moment after they've gone? It could be 10 years, it could be longer, when you say, okay, mm -hmm. everything's okay. And how did you get, how did you get to that beyond that? Because I know after she did die, you did have some struggles. And mm -hmm. I know you went to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and went through a workshop and, and dealt with loss and that kind of thing. But how do you get to the point, do you think, where you can say everything's okay? Well, that's a great question, Gloria. And I think that it has to happen kind of naturally. Mm -hmm. But I like to recommend to people that they allow for the possibility that the place of peace and contentment and sort of resolution that we're looking for at times like that is already inside us. Mm. That there's a place in our hearts that is just pure love and pure mm -hmm. peace and is joyful. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't go anywhere. When our mind is full of thoughts about this shouldn't have happened. I can't believe this happened. It's the most terrible thing that could possibly have happened. You just have to kind of go through all that. And it's almost like if you allow that process to go its natural course, eventually it's going to burn out. And you just finally will say, this is the reality. And 
I guess I can be at peace with it. Mm -hmm. I like that. He, mm -hmm. He's saying things that you need to go through things. Uh, we find that people need to talk about it, right, Heidi? Mm -hmm. Their experience? Absolutely, yeah. We see that with compassionate friends mm -hmm. uh, when we go to those conferences and things. People want to talk uh, about it. And I think it's almost like sometimes you get bored with your own story. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons right. for telling it. And you just keep right. telling it over and over right. again yeah. until you feel it's, it's, I think, a way of integrating into our being something that we can't comprehend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree so we just you. keep talking about it and talking yeah. about it. And finally, you would just kind of feel that integration happen. Mm -hmm. And the reality and permanence of it finally sets in. Yeah. And you're like, okay, this really happened. It's, it's interesting because every time you retell your story, it's almost like, wow, that really happened to me. Yeah. My brother died. This is real. I mean, you know, until you finally kind of work through that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, keep, and keep telling that mm -hmm. story. And finding safe people that can hear the story. Not everyone can hear the story. Right. That's true. And, and let yeah. you integrate it. I think a lot of people wind up feeling that they've been somewhat deserted by their family and friends because mm -hmm. there is a tendency for people to stay away when there's been a big loss. Mm -hmm. And so that also ties in the forgiveness piece that you spoke about earlier, Gloria. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that um, what I try to share with people is it isn't that your friends and family don't love you, it's that they're not skilled in handling mm -hmm. something like this, they're afraid they may say something that makes it worse. Mm -hmm. So they sort of stay away, mm -hmm. but there are people like us, mm -hmm. you know, who are happy to be with people going through those kinds of experiences. And ultimately realize that, you know, what m many, many, many people have shared with me over the years when I asked what was most helpful, mm -hmm. people will say, well, actually, it was my friends who came to the house and cried with me. Mm -hmm. That was helpful because there was heart-to-heart -heart connection mm -hmm. and people realizing there isn't anything you can say to change the reality or to take away the pain, but to incorporate the love mm -hmm. of friends who are willing to be there when you're in pain. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible blessing. And unfortunately, you may lose some friends, too. And, uh, and, and they may come back later, and you'll have to decide if you're going to welcome them into your heart. It may be four years later before people, you know, return back to your heart. What's your uh, feeling about that with siblings, Heidi? Well, you know, we've had a bunch of conversations about this in our shows, and one thing that I love, I always thought that all my friends needed to be there to support me around my brother's death. Mm -hmm. However, now I realize that some friends are there to distract us. Uh -huh. Some friends are there to play with us. Uh -huh. Some friends are there to support us and talk about it. Mm -hmm. So friends serve a different different role. So mm -hmm. not to expect that everyone is going to be good grief support. Mm -hmm. And also that sometimes we need to educate people on what we need because people aren't psychic. Right. And sometimes you think they should be. Right. Read my body language and know what I want, and right. they don't. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm wondering as a teenager, you're 18, you don't, your mom is gone. And I imagine that none of your friends had ever had, most of them have probably not had a loss, I'm guessing. That's true. And yeah. so where did you get support? Well, you know, it was very interesting. I think, again, nobody knew what to say, mm -hmm. and there was nothing to say. Yeah. But it was so touching to me, the friends from high school who came to mm -hmm. my mother's wake and mm -hmm. to her funeral, and just to see them walk in and be there and be of support, that was enough, you know? Yeah. And one day in the funeral home, it was a little bit overwhelming to me. And uh, a couple of friends were there and they said, let's go get a hamburger. So we just went out to the local diner and got lunch and then I was sort of fortified to come back. Right, I love that mm -hmm. because that's what Heidi's saying. That might yeah. be a friend who yeah. couldn't sit that's and listen right. to your story but they'd say, hey buddy, let's go get yeah. a hamburger. Right. Yeah, well, um, one of the support people in the world is certainly Blaine Wayne Dyer mm -hmm. and um, for those who don't know him, you might want to take a look uh, on your television set. You can uh, go to YouTube. He's done a lot of them for public. Uh, radio, wonderful man. Heidi, you were saying some things that you liked about him. I loved him. I, I read so many things that he did, especially early on in my career. Um, and if you Google him, you'll see a lot of stuff that he's done. But I just love the idea of the mind-body connection mm -hmm. and of, you know, how what we think is how we feel. Mm 
-hmm. And if we put negative thoughts into our lives and start getting into negative places, we're going to feel really bad and we're going to work ourselves into a deep, dark place. Right. Right. Um, he was just an amazing, inspirational man, and I didn't know him, but he's had a huge impact on the way I work. Uh -huh. And so I know that you guys were friends, and we did wonder and wanted to touch base with you about how this has all been for you. His death? such a good friend, yes. Well, it wasn't necessarily a surprise because mm -hmm. he'd been dealing with a lot of physical issues for several years. And as I said earlier, you know, he, he was very good at not appearing to be suffering, mm -hmm. you know. So, but those of us who knew him knew that he was. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that his life was so complete, you know, he mm -hmm. really wasn't, he was somebody who lived his life fully, who yeah. followed his dreams and his passions. He loved his family dearly. Mm -hmm. And it was very clear that his children came first, always mm -hmm. in his life. And the last time I saw him uh, was um, summer of, 19, of uh, 2014. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had all his children on Maui. Was in Maui then? Uh -huh. uh -huh. yeah, the, all the children were visiting, and you know he was really occupied with that. Mm -hmm. and, I thought it might be fun to see a little clip. I mean, it's a little short clip. It's a, right. it's a long clip, and if you want to watch the whole thing, it's about the Tao Te Chong. Uh, he was giving a lecture about it, and it, it, it's certainly worth uh, watching the whole thing. You can uh, go on YouTube and get it. But we're going to just do a, show a little bit of the first clip of it. Uh, and I think it's kind of fun to see him come out of the stage mm -hmm. and be uh -huh. Maui. And he was, he was bigger than life. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, we didn't know him, but it's just so interesting how we all miss him knowing mm -hmm. we're not going to get any more of his good stuff. Yeah. 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 You know? So but we've people, got a lot of it to, to sample. That's mm -hmm. true. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, why don't we take a look at that clip? About changing your life not in the traditional way that we think of when we think about changing our lives usually that means changing your behaviors retraining yourself getting new habits going out and trying them out and changing your life this is about changing your thoughts and then your life will change change your thoughts change your life it's the name of this program it's the name of the book it is something that i very very strongly endorse that we have within us the ability and the capacity through the way that we use our minds and the way that we process things and events to make our lives totally shift and change around and I can tell you that it doesn't make any difference what age you are whether you're a teenager watching this or whether you're someone uh, in your 60s 70s 80s or anywhere along the way you can make that change and I'll tell you it happened for me uh, two years ago, on the uh, 10th of May, uh, I turned 65, and the next day, uh, on the 11th of May, I <clears throat> had a life-changing thing take place for me. I changed the way that I was thinking about who I am, about what kind of a man I am, about what kind of a person I intend to be for the rest of my life and where I'm going. And something began to resonate with me that I had to make a shift and make a change at the age of 65. I had a, uh, a wonderful uh, office, uh, which was really a townhouse. It was filled with over 20,000 books. It was filled with clothing. It was filled with uh, records of all kinds. It had uh, pictures on the wall. I had awards that I had received over the years and everything that I had accumulated literally in this physical world um, had accumulated in that office. I turned the key and handed it to my manager, Maya, who's been with me for almost 30 years, and I said, I would like you to sell everything or distribute everything that's in there. Sell the townhouse, get rid of it take all the records, all the books, I got rid of my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, <clears throat> left it all behind and turned it over to her to get, to get rid of everything. I detached myself from a lifetime of accumulations and I moved uh, full time to a place uh, over in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on one of our great islands called Maui. And in the next um, 
months, I began to get a lot of things coming to me about what my life was to, uh, what was to unfold, things that I wasn't even expecting. And I think about this idea about uh, what age you are and um, whether or not changes and shifts can be made and how difficult so many people uh, attribute this to. They say, it's just, that's an impossibility. I couldn't possibly do that. I'm so attached to all of these things. Or I'm too old. Uh, I've, been, I've been living in the same place too long, whatever it might be. Uh, right here in this audience is one of, the, uh, one of the women that I revere. I think more than, uh, more than any other woman I can think of in the professional world. Um, at the age of 60, she changed her thoughts, and her life changed dramatically. She started a publishing company called Hay House, which is one of the world's largest publishers of spiritual and higher consciousness materials. She wrote a book called You Can Heal Your Life. She's here today. Her name is Louise. Hey, Louise, would you stand up? Oh, amazing uh, clip about Wayne. Um, did you know him when he gave up all this stuff? I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah he, I, I found a book that I had given him on the internet for sale. Oh, wow. Oh, that's funny. Signed by me. That's, wow. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, we wanted to give this tribute to Wayne, and uh, I know he said that he was going on to a better place. Mm -hmm. um, or a different place or a mm -hmm. different reality, mm -hmm. uh, which was pretty a pretty amazing thing. And uh, we just wanted to, as I said, give a tribute to him and, and thank you for so much for being on our show today. And, oh, my pleasure. And yeah. great to see Wayne, too. And great to be with both <laughs> yeah. of you. Yeah. Thank you, John, yeah. and thank you for everything that you're doing out there in the world of grief and loss, and thank you for helping people find hope after loss. It's a blessing. It's really, I can't imagine any work that I could do that would be more fulfilling uh -huh. than to help people at the difficult times in life. So many in the culture really don't know how to even begin to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you again, and uh, we'll hope to have you on again and uh, see more anytime, of you. Anytime. Anytime. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for watching this show, and God bless. <laughs>